Well, good morning, church. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Uh, glad you're uh, here this morning. Hope you've had a wonderful Christmas uh, with your family celebrating the birth of Christ. Looking forward to a great uh, New Year. My family uh, and I, Paula and I, just uh, returned from uh, Paris, where our son and his family, my four grandkids, uh, are in language school as missionaries there learning the French language and uh, getting ready for their appointment in, in West uh, Africa. So we had a good time uh, ministering to them, pouring into them, and loving on uh, family. And so just got back last night and looked forward to uh, sharing uh, with you. And so the, my son is a, a Southern Baptist and his family are Southern Baptist missionaries. And so just wanted to thank you for your support and prayers for our missionaries and, and what we've just gone through the season of prayer for international missions and the Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering goes to support over 3,000 uh, of our Southern Baptist missionaries serving all over uh, the world. My son and his family are part of that. So 100% of that offering goes to support uh, your Southern Baptist uh, missionaries. And I just wanted to thank you because my, my son and his family are beneficiaries of your prayers and that, uh, and that uh, support. So, you know, spent a week uh, in Paris, outside of Paris and in Paris, and so learned a little bit of French. My, my grandson, who is five, he's got it down, or six, he's got it down pat, and he was laughing at us all week on how to, how to say stuff. So I'm going to try two things. Uh, Merry Christmas is Joyax Noel. I think that's right. And uh, Happy New Year is, is Bon Ani. Bon So, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. <laughs> I don't know if I said that right, but Bonjour and Merci. And so, I got a little bit uh, of French, so I had a good time uh, with family. And so, just wanted to let you know that it's still Christmas time. Today is New Year's Eve, but it's still Christmas time. How many of you still have your Christmas decorations up? Not as many as the first service, but good. So you're you're a fan of uh, those of you that are fans of Downton Abbey. You know, Mary, in one episode, she said, you know, the, the, the tree does not come down to Epiphany, which is January uh, 6th. And then David Crowder, if you're a David Crowder band or, da- or Crowder uh, fan in his, their album, uh, Ode to Joy, you know, he gives a little introduction before the carols of the bell uh, song on there. And he just talks about it being, still being Christmas and, you know, Epiphany doesn't come till uh, January 6th, uh, which is correct. And he said, so, so kids, it's still Christmas time. And so it is Christmas time. We're, we're transferring or transitioning from Advent, the season of Advent. We've been in all of December and Pastor Matt did a wonderful uh, sermon series on Advent where he covered, you know, love and joy uh, and, and hope. Uh, and peace on Christmas Eve. And so those are all Advent related, preparing for the Messiah's coming and celebrating the Messiah coming. So now we transition on the Christian calendar, church uh, calendar. Epiphany uh, is on January 6th and the 12 days of Christmas uh, that you've heard of, even the, the song is based from those 12 days between you know Christmas Day and January 6th. And so January 6th, uh, is, is Epiphany, which is uh, celebrates the manifestation of the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah has come, uh, and and the and the Savior has come for all the world, and it acknowledges the the wise men, the Magi, coming to visit Jesus as a child and presenting those gifts as the first Gentiles to worship uh, Jesus. And so that's what Epiphany is, and that's, and that's what our passage. Uh, is going to be on uh, this morning. The sermons on Matthew two, uh, verses one through twelve. But before we get in to that, I want to just give you a little background on Matthew. This is the second chapter of Matthew. Matthew uh, is the first gospel in Scripture in the Bible, but it was not the first gospel uh, written. Uh, most scholars believe that Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark, was the first one uh, written, and then Matthew and Luke for those Gospels took a lot of information from Mark's uh, Gospel. But uh, Matthew, you know, he was the tax collector, the publican that became a disciple, and uh, his audience was to the Jewish people, that the Messiah was to be, uh, you know, from the, the Jews. And so Matthew 1 uh, gives the genealogy 
uh, of Jesus from being a son of Abraham and then a descendant of David and all, uh, you know, all the descendants leading up. And there's some women uh, in that genealogy going back for prophecy about Jesus being uh, the Messiah. And so the, the theme of, of Matthew is Jesus is the king of the Jews. Uh, and Jesus is referred to as the son of man uh, throughout uh, Matthew. And there's uh, in Matthew's own, uh, the gospel, it's got the most references to the biblical prophecies of Jesus being uh, the Messiah. And so two of those, uh, two of those are uh, Isaiah 7, 14. You'll notice that's referred to in Matthew uh, 1, which says, which foretells the virgin's birth. It says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. That's right between the angel tells Joseph that uh, Mary's going to have a child and you're to name him uh, Jesus, which means Emmanuel, God with us. And then in, in, in chapter 2, we'll look at in just a minute, uh, is, uh, is Micah 5, 2, which is predicting the Messiah's birthplace, which is Bethlehem. But it says, But you, O Bethlehem, Epaphrath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from one who is, who is to be the ruler in Israel, who's coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And that's in Matthew 2, 6. So this transition from Advent, from preparing for the Savior, for the Messiah to come, to Epiphany, where we celebrate the manifestation that Christ has come and that uh, Christ came for all the world, not just for uh, the Jews. So we shift our focus from anticipation to revelation, from the expected to the manifested. And so we're going to look at, at a, a passage, at a sermon this morning I, I've entitled Worthy Worship of the King, uh, Lessons of the Magi, with the focus on looking at the worship aspect of this passage, the different forms of worship, uh, false worship uh, in there, the lack of worship uh, from some. So the theme is this, looking at the worship portion on there. So if you'll stand, if you're able, uh, we're going to read uh, Matthew 2, uh, verses 1 through 12 uh, together. And I'll be reading from the ESV uh, version. So now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people uh, Israel." And then verse 7, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. You may be seated. Now, Pastor Matt, back in December of 2000, he did a whole series uh, on this passage called The Gift and went through each of the gifts and, and, and Christmas Eve service on that. So he, he gave a lot of detail and background uh, on who the wise men were, what the setting was uh, for that, what the gifts represented and how we're to worship that. But you can still go and I'm going to do try in 35, maybe 40 minutes, what Matt did with four, <laughs> four uh, sermons. It's, so it's sort of a, a concise part, but the focus of, of today is going to be looking at the worship aspect of that. And by the way, you can still go back and get, if you want to, you can read the transcripts of those messages back. Look at, you know, just do gift, uh, December of 20, uh, of 2000. Uh, and you can you know, hear the recording or you can uh, read the transcript of that. Just a lot more 
you can check what I say <laughs> today, but it gives you a lot more information on that. So what does the Bible say about the Magi? Not much. It says the Magi came from the east. That's about all it says uh, about that. And so there's been a lot of assumptions or tradition has added a lot of things uh, to that. But we know that they, uh, they came uh, from the east. Uh, they were in the east, and so they came seeing the star. They weren't from the Orient. Uh, it's speculated that they're from the Babylon or Persia, which is now uh, Iran. Uh, and so they, Magi, the word Magi, what they, they, what they were, they were trusted advisors of the kings. Uh, they were also king makers. You know, a king wasn't a king unless it passed through the Magi for their uh, approval. But, uh, but they were, they were advisors of the king. They were learned men, proficient in the knowledge uh, <clears throat> of mathematics uh, and calculations for astronomy. They studied uh, the stars and, and that type of thing. It wasn't astrology, it was astronomy. Uh, they were knowledgeable of medicine and alchemy and, and you know, medicines, uh, that type of thing, and dream interpretation. Now, you may think the dream interpretation, that goes back to the Old Testament to, to Joseph. You know, he had dreams and they were uh, interpreted. And then in Daniel, you know, Daniel became a magi for King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, you've heard the stories of Daniel and there's prophecies uh, in Daniel that, that go out and, and, and uh, prophesy about where Jesus was going to be born, the timing of when the Messiah uh, would be born. And so most scholars, a lot of scholars agree that uh, this magi, this group of magi, 600 years before the coming of the birth of Christ, they had the influence of Daniel, who was the chief uh, magi at the time when he was serving uh, in that court. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information uh, there about uh, that, and I'll get that uh, in a minute. But the number, uh, you know, we don't know the number of the magi. You know, we assume from Christmas cards and manger scenes there were how many? It doesn't say. You know, Scripture doesn't say that. Tradition uh, just says, you know, three based on the three gifts uh, that were given. But uh, uh, most think that it was, a, it was an entourage. It was a lot of people that came uh, with these uh, wise men. More than three, you know, it had to be a lot. And what we read in Scripture that, that Herod was alarmed and, uh, and all of Jerusalem was alarmed. And so I don't think Herod would be alarmed if just three magi came into town. They would come in unnoticed. But an entourage would be noticed and he would feel threatened uh, from that. J. Vernon McGee, uh, in his commentary on Matthew, he said, I believe there were 300, not three. Now, it does not say in Scripture that there were 300. That's what I think. So don't tell anybody that I said that there were 300 magi in Scripture. So we don't know. That's just his <laughs> guess as well as any other. But chances are there were a lot more than three uh, magi. There's, there's, they don't have names uh, in Scripture. That's another thing that came from our early uh, Christmas uh, tradition uh, with the names of Balthasar, Melchor, and Gathaspa, uh, but we don't know. I mean, they, they weren't named in Scripture, so we don't have any evidence uh, of that. And so uh, they had seen the star in the east, so they were from the east, and it was from the east they, they saw the star. It wasn't the star that was in the east. They came uh, from the east. Uh, the Magi came from Persia or Babylon, uh, and it was estimated about four. If it came from Persia, if they came from Persia, that's about fourteen hundred miles uh, to Bethlehem. If they came from Babylon, it's about uh, six hundred or, or so. So we know that it took them a while uh, to get there. And when they got when they got to the scene. You know, they, the, it says the child was the child. It wasn't a baby. Jesus wasn't a baby. It was a child was in the house. And so they, had, they were still in Bethlehem, but they had gone from that temporary manger uh, scene and, and gotten uh, access to a home uh, to be in. And so the, and, and it, took them, you know, it took them a while to get there. So the you know, projections are guesstimates on how old Jesus was from anywhere from 10 months old as a toddler uh, up to two, maybe three years Old, and it took, him, it took the wise men that long uh, to come. But we do know uh, this is that uh, they, uh, we'll go back to Daniel uh, right quick. Daniel, 
uh, there's, there's three verses of prophecy or three passages of prophecy in Daniel that these magi would have learned about in the if tradition passed on. So they would have known uh, based on, you know, uh, whatever uh, astronomy or the teachings of Daniel and, uh, and the teachings of the law. But uh, Daniel 5.11 was, pro- uh, it says uh, Daniel was probably the, or the rab mag or the chief of the magi. Uh, and so, and then there's also, and there's a, a, that verse uh, prophesies uh, that uh, Jesus would be the Messiah born uh, in Bethlehem, made over 600 years earlier. And then Daniel 24, 7 uh, says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy Place and this is a prophecy that gives the timeline of the birth of Messiah. Then uh, Daniel nine twenty five says, "Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in the troubled time, anointed one and the temple." Rebuilt. So this is a prophecy of, of the anointed one, the Messiah coming, and that the temple will be rebuilt, which King Herod in this passage did. He rebuilt the temple uh, in, in Jerusalem. So they had a timeline to look at and, and were expecting. So uh, they, were, they were sojourners. They came. They were the first Gentiles. Uh, to worship Jesus, which goes and say with Matthew's gospel, saying that the gospel of Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, not just the Jewish uh, people. And so their fourth gift uh, of the Magi to Jesus, we're going to talk about three of them, but their fourth one was worship. They came to worship the King of Kings, the King of the Jews. And so that's the theme of today's uh, sermon is, is the worship of these uh, of these magi, these wise men, and also what we can learn from what Herod said about worship and about what the religious leaders uh, in Jerusalem said about uh, worship. And so uh, what lessons can we learn from these wise men in the worship of the king? The focus is on worship. Now, definition or a, a definition of worship is that worship at its core is an expression of reverence, adoration, and submission toward the divine. An expression of reverence, adoration, and submission or humble worship toward Jesus. It's it's worth-ship, what it's worth. Jesus is worthy to be worshipped. And we need to worship in a worthy manner. And so we can learn that lesson from these from these uh, magi. So uh, the the Jeremiah twenty if you're here this morning uh, and you're seeking God, if you're seeking the Messiah. If you haven't met him, Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen uh, says this: "You shall seek for me and find me when you search for me with all your heart." So, if you're here searching, if you're here, you're, you've heard about this Jesus, this Messiah. Why are we worship? And you're here just out of curiosity that He is the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and He came that all of us, all of us. To live with him in heaven and have and live in glory and as because of his sacrificial death on the Christ he came as a baby to die as our savior and so uh, I just hope that you'll you'll meet Jesus this Messiah uh, this morning so uh, looking at the, the the first point here in the title uh, in the message is a worship that guides following his star a divine sign so it says the, the wise men came and they, they followed his star. They refer to it as his star. And so the first point uh, under this is the wondrous star of divine guidance. It was a wondrous star of divine guidance. We don't know a lot about the star. It just says his star and that it, uh, that it guided them from wherever they came from to the point that it moved uh, and it moved over the place, exactly over the place uh, where Jesus and his family were in a house in Bethlehem. So we know uh, that it moved. It says so uh, in verse 2 of chapter 2 it says, for we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. They didn't come out of curiosity. They came with a purpose. And that purpose, the star guided him. The purpose, they came to worship him. And it appears in scripture that the magi, the wise men, were the only ones that saw this star. 
It doesn't say that anybody, no evidence there in Scripture that anybody else, so it appeared just to them, and we know it moved around. Numbers 14, uh, excuse me, Numbers 24, 17 is also a prophecy that these uh, these wise men, these magi would have known about. Numbers 24, 17 says, A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. So they knew about that one too, and so they knew that this was uh, his star. And so what is speculated, you know, some say it's, uh, you know, the, the three planets, you know, came together and looked like a very bright star they call the Christmas star. Some say it could have been a comet. Some say it could be in a supernova. Uh, but all of those things would not move, you know, and show the, and give direction uh, on that. So it's seen as a supernatural miracle uh, for this guiding star uh, that 's a miracle that cannot be explained, and so others uh, uh, the word star here is a number of meanings in the Bible, and it comes from a root word that literally means brilliance or a brilliant light. We see this brilliant light less uh, and when Pastor Matt uh, spoke about glory uh, there where the shepherds came and the angelic host, and there was a bright light, a brilliant uh, light, and we also can say that uh, this brilliant light was was more than likely it was Shekinah glory of God. It was the presence of God guiding these uh, these men and their entourage to see where Jesus was. And the Shekinah glory of God is in the Old Testament, where uh, in the, especially in Exodus, where he guided uh, he guided the people of Israel by what a cloud of fire. And so he got it, it moved him, it directed him where they were supposed to go. And, and then it, uh, his Shekinah glory was in the Ark of the Covenant. Then his Shekinah glory was in the temple. And so more than likely we're going to go on that, that this, this star was a, a supernatural miracle uh, event that was a Shekinah glory of God guiding uh, this group. And it's cause, because the glory of God has already led the people in the Old Testament, uh, we seal that. So the, the Shekinah glory of God is the brilliance of God. A physical manifestation of God's glory, and of course it could move, and it did move, and it guided these people through the wilderness, and it guided these magi to see uh, where Christ uh, was born, to see where, where he was uh, living there uh, in Bethlehem. And uh, application uh, for this is our worship should be guided by divine signs. Our worship should be divided by the guy, divine signs recognizing the king's presence in our life. So what signs are directing you or guiding you uh, in worship uh, today? These men witnessed the miracle of the star, the Shekinah glory of God, and it led them step by step. It, it took them straight to where Jesus was and to the presence of Jesus. So what has led you this morning into the presence of Jesus for you to worship? Is that why you're here this morning to worship? Or are you for here for other reasons? And so, have you what divine signs have you let allow you to come? The, the wise men overcame obstacles by not succumbing to fear or political uh, agendas and the danger of a, such a long uh, journey. You know, in Herod, uh, and when it says Herod, uh, which is Herod the Great, he wanted he told the wise men, "Hey, come, you know, tell me where Jesus is so I can worship." Uh, him too, but that was really not his uh, intention. Adrian Rogers uh, says, the wisest thing you can do at Christmas time or any other time is to worship Jesus. In spite of difficulty, distance, discomfort, and danger, these wise men sought to worship Jesus the Christ. And again, they were the first Gentiles to worship uh, Jesus. So what the next point is overcoming obstacles in worship. Have you had to overcome any obstacles to get here today? What has prevented you from coming to worship in the past? What could prevent you from being an obstacle to come worship in the future? You got here today uh, to worship. So what obstacles are you having uh, to overcome? When Herod the king heard this, in verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem uh, with him. So Herod in here is Herod the Great. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a lot about him in history, but not so much uh, in the Bible. It was at the, toward the end uh, of his reign uh, there. And so uh, the, he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, he also 
uh, built the you know palace of Masada. If you've been there, and uh, and but he was a very ruthless, evil man. He was very jealous. Uh, and he was thought of as you know he, his title was king of the Jews. And here the wise men are coming and say, hey, you know we're look, we've heard the king of the Jews has been born. Can you tell us? Where that is, and so the the wise men that that could have been a dangerous obstacle from them from a political point of view because he could you know Herod could put him you know send him away or put him in jail or or even kill him like he did his wife his favorite wife and two of his sons because he was jealous of his reign and his rule so those were obstacles that these uh, these wise men these magi uh, have to over. Come And so next is a joyful response to divine revelation. There was a joyful response to divine res- revelation. So when, they, when the star appeared to them again to guide them, it says they were, they were overcome uh, with joy and exceedingly great joy. So when is the last time you had exceedingly great joy in your worship of the king? When's the last time you experienced exceedingly great joy? And it may not be in in church or worship or in your quiet time. Now, I mean, if you're a football fan, whatever team, I'm not going to push that. But you get exceedingly, you have exceedingly great joy when they win or when they do good. But do we have exceedingly great joy when we worship the king in church? And so the wise men responded with joyful worship expressing dedication and reverence in the presence of the king. So you're in church as we worship corporately. We're in the presence of Jesus. Do we worship accordingly to that? Do we humbly worship? Do we worship with joy? Are we joy-filled when we leave this place? So they had a joyful response to divine revelation because they, these wise men, they believed Jesus to be divine to be the king of kings. Now, the application to this, what we can learn is our worship, our worship should be uh, characterized by joyful devotion to the king. Does that characterize your worship this year, this week, this month, today? Is it exceedingly great joy? And so when was the last time you felt joyous about your relationship or with Christ. Now, if you're here this morning, you're seeking, you're without Christ, you're not going to have that joy in worship because you don't know the Savior. And our prayer is today that you'll come to know the King of kings and Lord and Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. So you can worship Him with exceeding great joy. Now, the second uh, point here is worship that honors uh, recognizing the King of kings. Their worship honored Jesus as the Messiah as the king of kings, as the king of the Jews. And so the first point under that is Herod's wrong motives uh, in worship. So we're going to look at different aspects of worship. Herod told him, said, hey, you know, when you find him, you know, come back and tell me where he is, where this Christ is, where the king of uh, the Jews is, so I can come and worship him too. And again, that was, you know, that was not the motivating factor that he did not want to worship this expected king, he wanted to get rid of it. He wanted to stifle it. He wanted to know who it was so he could get rid of him like he did his, any, anybody that challenged uh, his reign. And you see after this passage uh, in Matthew 2 that, you know, Herod does, he orders all the, the boys born, you know, two years old uh, or let, you know, to be, to be killed. So King Herod was a ruthless uh, man that did that. But so he didn't, so that was, that was a false impression or false desire uh, to worship. So as we look this morning, uh, Herod's troubled reaction exposed his wrong motives uh, in wanting to worship Christ for his personal gain. It was false worship. It wasn't sincere, sincere uh, in t- intentions. So what, what is it in our life, in your, in your worship, that may be false, that may not be vo- motivated to give worship and adoration to Jesus as the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of, God, Lord of lords, God Almighty, What's your false reasons for being in worship today? If it's not to worship the king, then it's a false, it's a false uh, motive. And so the application for this one uh, is our worship should be free from personal agendas, honoring the holy king with pure motives. 
Are you here with pure motives to worship this morning? What brought you here? What motivated you to come? Well, my parents made me. Or, you know, we're supposed to at Christmas. Or I just came to be seen and to see friends. What's your pure, what's your, what's your true motivation for worship? An application here, our worship should be free from the personal agendas, honoring the holy king. So how are you honoring the king today with pure motives uh, for worship? How are you, what are your motives for the worship of the king? Are you prepared to receive a powerful word and blessing from God today? We've had powerful worship this morning. And what are you receiving from uh, your gift? Uh, God's gift from you is his word. What are you receiving from that? And does it make you joyful and joyous? And then the next point there is knowledgeable yet unbelieving religious leaders. Here it says, you know, King, uh, King Herod came to these. Uh, he called his, his, wise, his uh, religious leaders the chief priests uh, and scribes. Uh, and Pharisees, they were the religious leaders that were also alarmed. And he said, can you tell us where the king of the Jews is supposed to be born? And they said, yeah, it's in, you know, uh, it's in Micah. You know, the, the Bethlehem uh, is the place. But, you know, there's no record in Scripture that these, these leaders tried to go see for themselves if this really was the Messiah, the promised king uh, of the Jews, the promised king of kings. And so they knew, they had head knowledge of all the law. And all the prophecies of of Jesus being the Messiah. But they didn't recognize. They didn't recognize. They met. They missed an opportunity to worship the Messiah. They missed it. They denied it. There was no no worship there. So you, uh, you may have head knowledge. You may know the scriptures. You may know what the scripture says. But or do you have transformational faith? Uh, because of those scriptures, have you given your heart? Have you surrendered your heart and your life to Christ? Or you just know what the Bible says? You know, scripture says even the demons know the scripture and they shudder. And they shudder. And so they say the, the longest 12 inches uh, of uh, anywhere is between your head and your heart. From getting the knowledge of scripture to your transformed life because of scripture. So are you here? You know, without a relationship with Christ, but you're trying to worship. You're trying to worship this God, this Jesus that you haven't surrendered your life to. You cannot have joyful, true worship if you don't know the object of your worship. And that's not worshiping in a worthy manner. And so our, our worship, the application here is our worship should be characterized by transformative faith, not just head knowledge, not just head knowledge. And then the, the C point here under that one is humble worship uh, in Bethlehem where, the, where they come and give the gifts uh, to, uh, to Jesus. They were, there was humble uh, worship there. So the next point there is worship that, that brings joy and gifts of adoration. And so here's where the, the three gifts uh, are mentioned. They, they came to worship and they brought three very significant gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so the gold, uh, the gold represents uh, authority. It represents kingship. They worshiped him as the king of kings, king of the Jews. Gold was the medal of the kings. It was in, in their crowns, in their jewelry, in their throne, in their scepters. It was a medal of the kings. And so it was a very valuable uh, gift. And, uh, you know, scholars again speculate that they used the, the gold there for their trip, uh, Mary and Joseph for their trip the, when they left to, uh, to escape Herod's uh, killing the kids. They went to Egypt and say that, you know, that, that gold financed, you know, that trip and possibly even the ministry uh, of Jesus. And so it was a very significant uh, gift. The gift of gold was profound acknowledgement of Jesus as the king of kings. And it symbolizes his regal authority, majesty, and sovereignty over all. And the application here is our, our worship should recognize Jesus as the king, offer him honor due to his authority as the king, as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So our worship should acknowledge him. Uh, he should be the Lord of our lives. As in Schwimmer is the one credited with the statement of Jesus is, a, is not Lord of all, that he's not Lord at all in your life. 
And so for King Jesus to be Lord of all, you need to surrender your life to King Jesus. Uh, then frankincense was the next uh, gift. And frankincense, again, was a valuable uh, uh, incense, a valuable uh, part of worship, the sacrificial uh, worship where they was, and it comes from the Boswellia tree in the India uh, area. Uh, and that's also, if you look at some anti-inflammatory things uh, used, you see Boswellia thing, that's a form of, of uh, incense, a form of uh, frankincense. And so it was very valuable and it refers and it worships of the significance there as we worship Jesus as our high priest as there's no other way uh, to God but through Jesus. And Jesus sits at the right throne, at the right hand of God, interceding for us. He is our high priest. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 said, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he has faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So the application here is our worship should acknowledge Jesus as our high priest, our mediator, and that there's no other uh, way to, to God but through Christ. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, because he is the high priest. He paid the debt for our sin. He made the way for us to have a relationship uh, with God. And then myrrh uh, is the last one. And myrrh was uh, another valuable uh, perfume, very aromatic and very strong. It was used, uh, if you remember, when Je- they tried to give Jesus some wine mixed with myrrh uh, at the crucifixion, and he uh, he he rejected that because it had pain killing uh, aspects uh, to it. And also uh, Nicodemus, you know, it says he bought seventy five pounds of myrrh for to anoint Jesus' body uh, for burial. And so here it 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 honors Christ for his sacrificial death. For us on the cross, and uh, there's also a passage in, uh, in Isaiah for the second coming, for the second coming uh, of Christ, and it's Isaiah uh, 60, uh, if I can find uh, that. But anyway, Isaiah 60 it mentions it's the second coming of Christ uh, prophecy, and it mentions the gold and the frankincense, but it does not mention uh, the myrrh. Because the second coming, he's already died for us. But the second coming, he's coming back in victory. So there's no need for that burial uh, on, on that. And so the, the myrrh application is our worship to embrace sacrificial giving, recognizing the death of Jesus' sacrifice uh, for us. And so what are you, as we, as we look at these three gifts and look at the way these wise men worshiped, how are you giving out of your resources. Your resources are your gold. What gold are you giving Jesus today as your gift? Are you, are you experiencing Jesus as the high priest that's interceding for us on, on our behalf to God, that we have access to God, that have, we have a relationship with God because Jesus is our high priest, and that's the only way uh, to heaven. And have you accepted that sacrificial gift of myrrh, that you recognize Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, for salvation of your soul. And so are you here this morning and you you need to give your heart to Christ. You need to worship him as a true believer. Today, let today be the day of salvation for you trust Jesus as the King of Kings. Trust Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, who loves you and gave his life for you. Or you may, you may say, well, I've, you know, I've been worshiping in an unworthy manner. I haven't truly been worshiping Jesus as king. And so what would be your response in worship today? You can do the next steps uh, form on the, on the worship guide or on the screen. If you need to accept Christ, trust Christ, surrender your heart to Christ as Lord and Savior for the first time. You know, we want to pray with you about that. Some, uh, one of the pastors or somebody will get in touch with you within, if you put that on the next steps. Or you may you know, accept Christ or you need to be baptized. You may have uh, been a Christian, but you haven't followed through in obedience to believers' uh, baptism. Uh, we would like to talk to you about that and pray for you. Or if you want to need to get connected to a life group or a, a body here that uh, provides fellowship and spiritual growth uh, for you, or you just need, you just need prayer. 
what will your decision and commitment be today i'll be over here in the corner next steps if you need to pray uh, or talk so uh, stand as we respond in worship